so quiet. Good morning, everyone. <laughs> if, you're, if you're able, please stand with us as we start this morning. You are not alone if you are lonely when you feel afraid. You're not the only. We are all the same in need of mercy to be forgiven and be free. It's all you got to lean on, but thank God it's all you need. And all the people said amen. Whoa. Welcome to Verndale Alliance Church, those that are here, those that are in the video cafe, and those watching at home. Uh, glad you could be here. Uh, extra special welcome to those that are visiting. Uh, make sure to stop by the Welcome Center and receive a gift for coming to worship with us this morning. Got a pretty good Sunday for you to come visit. Obviously, uh, graduates, so it's kind of in my realm, are going to be up here a little bit uh, sharing about what's going to be going on in their lives, so I'll look forward to that in a little bit. Uh, would you pray with me this morning? Father, I thank you for uh, this day. Lord, I thank you for this place that we can come, we can fellowship, we can worship together. Lord, I pray that any distractions that we brought in with us, Lord, may we lay them at your feet and may our focus be on you and you alone, Lord. Uh, Lord, may your name be glorified through everything that is said and done uh, from the message to the prayer to the music to the, the fellowship time afterwards, Lord. Uh, Lord, just may you receive all the glory and all the honor. Uh, and Lord, we just pray that your Holy Spirit would minister to, among your people, uh, both here in the building and, Lord, those watching at home, Lord. And we just thank you uh, for you and, and what you are doing in and among us, Lord. And we just ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. A few announcements for you. Uh, what was originally planned for the West Africa team to be sharing uh, this morning, that has been moved to two weeks from now, uh, May 21st. So plan to, uh, to listen to that during the service, and then also they'll be taking the Sunday school uh, class uh, on the 21st. Uh, Pastor Darrell's Sunday school class will not continue not to be, yeah, let me try that again. Pastor Darrell's class will not meet today for Sunday school. My class, however, will meet today for those that are able and used to going to that. Uh, the other announcements I have for you is Seniors Singles Fellowship for Women. 
I had to look at that to make sure I didn't tongue twist that one as well. Uh, that is meeting here at Thursday at 1.30 in the library. Uh, more information is in your bulletin about uh, who's involved, what's, what activities you'll be planning. So uh, look for that in the bulletin. And then the last is this Saturday is the men's breakfast here at the church at 8 a.m. And so men come if you are able to for that. Uh, with that, go ahead and stand as we continue to worship this morning. Sometimes I'm strong, sometimes I'm weak, sometimes I fall in my wandering. But through it all, there's just one thing more precious than the air I breathe. Grace, amazing grace, unfailing. Saves my soul. Grace, unending grace, unrelenting grace that won't let go. You took our sin, you took our stain, you took our guilt. Now there is no shame. This our reward. Eternal crown, the endless song, how sweet the sound. Grace, amazing grace, unfailing grace that saves my soul. Grace, unending grace, unrelenting grace that won't let.
At this time, we'll have all the graduates come on up. So as they make their way up here, uh, just how this is going to work. I got a couple questions we're going to ask them, uh, this, and then I got a scripture I want to read for them, a couple of points, a uh, comment I'll make, and then I'll pray over them, and then Pastor Darrell will come up. Oop. Actually, you're going to be last, so. A uh, couple questions we're going to ask, uh, as I mentioned to these guys. The first one, what's your plans after high school? They all want to know, and to save you guys from having to answer that same question 10, 15 times, so you're going to say to in front of everyone. Not to say there won't be any follow-up questions, but. Uh, and then the second one is, what is one thing, person, persons, event uh, relating to our church that has had an uh, impact on your guys' Christian walk? And so uh, we'll start with Reagan down there. I'm going to go to NDSU for interior design in the fall, and I would say doing verse time at Awano with Lou Johnson and my grandma most impacted me. I'm Becca Stanley. I'm going to Crown College for nursing. Um, I think just being involved in the youth group, going on all the camps and life conference and just being present in it has been an impact. Um, fellow classmates that are in it, and then also the leaders. Um, hello, I'm Tyus Russell, and uh, I'm going to NDSU for computer science. It's going to be my major. And the thing that impacted me most on my Christian walk was, I'd have to say, the life conference and the life small group. That, that time was awesome. I'm Dalton Moyer, and I will be attending West Point College in New York. For those who don't know, it's a military college, so yes, they will be shaving this mess off my head. Um, you know, I really enjoyed the youth group and Pastor Heath because the messages that we had, I think, really apply to, you know, to our age group. So I, I like that aspect. Hi, I'm Tori Hagan. I'm going to be going to M State in Moorhead for to get my generals done, and then. Probably life conference is probably the best. This is just a side note, just so you know the what you initially go into might not actually pan out the way you thought. Uh, I know I was going for accounting and ended up here. I haven't had even went to a college graduation uh, yesterday or a party, and she ended up getting the degree that I went for, and she let, let me know about that that she actually finished it. So. I want to read for you guys uh, Philippians uh, chapter 3, 12 through 14. Not that I have already obtained it or have already become perfect, but I press on so that I may lay hold of that for which also I was laid hold of by Christ Jesus. Brethren, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies ahead and reaching, or what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead. I press on towards the goal of the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Uh, so a few things I just want to mention with this to you guys as kind of a challenge. Uh, Paul, on a couple of occasions, uses our Christian walk in kind of a race or a, a, an athlete-type mentality. Uh, and so the runner, in this case, he kind of indicates as our Christian walk becoming Christ-like. Uh, the first thing in verse 12 that we kind of need, that you guys need to wrestle with is uh, two words. It needs to start with honesty and dissatisfaction. Honesty in the aspect that you're not there yet. You, you will never be there yet in this, uh, this side of glory. Uh, I'm sure there's a few in the audience like myself that felt like we arrived at certain times and we did not. And so uh, having that honesty that you're not there yet, but yet then the dissatisfaction that, you know, you're not there yet. You, got, you, gotta, you can press on and you can move forward. Uh, that press on uh, kind of notes for the runner the aggressive energetic action that that the drive that fire that passion to to keep pressing forward in your guys's Christian walk to become uh, like Christ uh, the second thing uh, in verse 13 that the forgetting what lies behind it's not talking about uh, forgetting Verndale or forgetting family and church and youth group it's not talking about that but it's you can't rely on your past uh, successes and past victories nor can you get bogged down by your past sins or failures. Uh, to, to kind of put it in the to track mentality, yeah, you've, you've finished maybe one lap, but yet you got more laps to go. And, and maybe that last lap wasn't the greatest. You fell down a couple times, but you get up, you keep going. Uh, God's got lots more uh, for you. 
And then the last thing, uh, verse 14, talks about the goal and prize. The goal is right here, right now, Christ-like, uh, something that you strive for right here, right now. Uh, but the prize is Christ-likeness uh, in heaven. Like, that's our ultimate ending place. And so we, as believers, we as Christians, we get to fight from victory, run from victory, not for it. And so uh, rest in those things. And uh, I know I speak for a lot of the group. We're, we're excited to see what God has for you and how he's going to use you. Uh, let me pray for you guys, and then you guys can go sit down. Father, I just thank you uh, for this group of seniors. Uh, Lord, their many accomplishments. Uh, Lord, the things that they have done and, and, and been a part of. Uh, Lord, I'm thankful for the opportunity I've gotten to know them, uh, seeing them grow. Uh, Lord, there's many in the audience that have seen even more growth since, uh, since they were babies, Lord. And, and Lord, we are so thankful uh, for them, thankful for you and your uh, protection over them. Uh, for your work in and through them. Uh, and yet, Lord, we realize that uh, you have only just begun in their life. Uh, Lord, uh, only one lap is about to pass, Lord, and they got many more laps to go. Uh, and so, Lord, I pray that you would just go before them. Uh, Lord, protect them wherever it is that you call them. Uh, lead them and guide them. Uh, and Lord, we're excited to see what you do in them and through them, Lord. Uh, Lord, may they be uh, world changers in their realm that they're called to, Lord. Uh, Lord, I just thank you uh, for them. And again, excited to see uh, their lives uh, moving forward. And, and Lord, may they uh, continue to honor you and everything that they say and they do, Lord. And we just, again, uh, lay them in your capable hands, knowing that you first love them. Uh, Lord, may they pursue after you and pursue after Christness and that Christ-likeness in everything that they do. Uh, Lord, we just ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, you guys can go sit down. Yeah. I've asked them to kind of hang out in the foyer, so if you have questions or want to greet them, you meet them there. As we go to prayer this morning, I have several things for us today. First of all, from Clarence and Mary Horsager, a prayer request. Uh, Mary goes back to Mayo Clinic this coming week to see uh, three doctors for eyes, blood, and kidneys. Her abnormal protein numbers are way up, causing more crystals forming on her corneas and uh, can cause cancer and other problems. She needs a breakthrough in her health for lowering these numbers and healing. We so appreciate your prayers. We do worship a good and faithful God. Thank you for your prayers. Love, Clarence and Mary. And I'd also like to ask a prayer for our daughter, Rachel. Um, she's not here this morning. Uh, we believe she has malaria, and uh, she got some medication last night for that, uh, but pray for healing uh, for her um, and the high fevers that she's been experiencing. Also, a prayer request for uh, Brock Graba. Brock is the nephew of Barry and Don Captain, and uh, he has uh, sustained another head injury. And uh, if you recall, about a year ago, uh, he had one, and so pray for healing for him. And then also a prayer request for um, Michelle Stanley and, and Mark Anson's aunt, Judy. Uh, she had cancer a while back. It has come back, and so pray for healing for her and for peace and comfort for the family. Let's bow together in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we come into your presence today so grateful that your grace is unrelenting and unending, that your grace is sufficient for whatever we face in life. We thank you that because of your grace, we can know that our sins are forgiven and that we have new life in Christ and, and the promise of eternal life in your presence. Father, I thank you for the graduates that were up here this morning uh, for their lives and their potential. I pray that they would keep their eyes on you, that, Lord, they would follow your leading and guiding in their lives, that they would continue to be involved in, in a church wherever they are, and, and, Lord, that they would seek to follow after you. I pray your blessing and your protection upon their lives. Father, I lift Mary up to you today, and I pray as she goes to Mayo this week that you would guide and direct the doctors meeting with her. I pray for wisdom and understanding. I pray, Lord, that 
that they would be able to find the right treatment plan for her. I ask you, Lord, to give Clarence and Mary your peace at this time, the awareness of your presence and your hand upon them. Father, I lift Brock uh, Graba up to you today and, and pray, Father, for healing for him, that you'd help him to recover from this head injury. I pray again for peace for the family. Uh, Lord, I ask you to watch over them and care for them. And, and Lord, may they sense that you're walking with them through all of this. And Father, I lift Rachel up to you today, and, and I pray for healing for her as well. Uh, Lord, I pray that this medication would be effective and, and that the fevers would, would be gone, and uh, Lord, that she would have a complete and full recovery. We're so thankful, Lord, that we can uh, cast our cares on you, knowing that you care for us. I lift Judy up to you today and her husband, Jerry. I pray, Father, for peace for them. Uh, Lord, as she battles cancer, I pray that she would uh, just have your strength, your help, uh, your healing touch, your peace in her heart and life, and for Jerry and, and the family as well, that they would know your love and care. Lord, we're so thankful that as, as we live in this world that is temporary, we thank you that our hope is eternal, that, Father, what you have promised us far exceeds anything that we experience in this life, and we thank you for that. Lord, as we continue in worship this morning, we pray that you would pour out your spirit upon us, move in hearts and lives, accomplish all that you want to do here today. I pray for pastor as he brings a message, that you would anoint and empower and speak through him today to your praise and glory. In Jesus' name, amen. If you're able, please stand again as we continue our worship this morning. When all I see is the battle, you see my victory.
You shine in the shadows. You win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. And almighty fortress, you go, you go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadows. You win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. No mighty fortress, you go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadows in every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. So when I fight, I'll fight on my with my hands lifted high, oh God, the battle belongs to you. And every fear I lay at your feet, I'll sing through the night, oh God, the battle belongs to you. time children three years old through fourth grade are dismissed for children's church I don't remember when I was in high school graduating having that clear a plan I think I don't know if that's a new phenomenon where we we want our kids to know what's coming next uh, Certainly wasn't what I grew up thinking about when people would ask me what's next. They said, I don't know, tomorrow. We'll see what comes when I get there. So just an encouragement to anybody who doesn't have a plan. It can still work out. The Lord is still, still good. If you have your Bibles, please, this morning open to Matthew chapter 4. We're continuing our examination of uh, the God who breaks through. We're going to transition now this week and the next couple of weeks uh, into... Uh, looking at some specific ways, some specific areas that we need the Lord to break through. We've spent the last couple of weeks sort of making the case uh, that God is the answer to the hard places. Uh, that, we, that if we would avail ourselves to what the Lord wants to do, if we will acknowledge the need is bigger than we are, if we'd seek His direction and respond in obedience. Uh, and then last week we looked at, at really just rejecting lesser things and seeing Christ as the answer to the question and trusting him in the hard places of life because he has already dealt with our sin, which is the ultimate hard place, that ultimate uh, wall that we cannot scale, we cannot break through. He has done that. And so we want to take that, uh, that case we've made and we kind of want to overlay it over several areas of life. Uh, the, the hardest part for me of this series was really trying to figure out where to cut it off. Uh, there is a lot of specific places where we could say, hey, can the Lord answer this situation or this one or this one? Uh, and, and I've limited it to just three. Uh, we're going to look uh, this morning at breakthroughs in temptation. How can the Lord break through those places where we so often find ourselves stuck at this decision of whether or not to follow the Lord or to do what is in front of us that we desire? Uh, we're going to move on from there. Uh, next week, we're going to talk about breaking through our fear. And then the last week, we're going to look at breakthroughs in difficult relationships. Uh, again, we could add a lot to that list. Uh, these three sort of rose to the surface for me. And I think they're fairly universal. Uh, this morning, we're going to talk about one that I'm quite certain is universal, uh, the issue of temptation and sin and how it is that the Lord can break through in those places. So let's go to a passage of Scripture, again, like last week, that might be somewhat familiar to some. Matthew chapter 4, beginning in verse 1, reading through verse 11, uh, Matthew's account of the temptation of Jesus Christ. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he then became hungry. And the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. 
Then the devil took him up into the holy city and had him stand on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down. For it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not strike your foot against the stone. Jesus said to him, On the other hand, it is written, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Again the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all of the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, All these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, Go, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and began ministering to him. Uh, this narrative is familiar to us. We're not going to uh, digest or, or dissect all of the nuts and pieces perhaps this morning, uh, but I think it's worth noting the context in which we find Christ. Uh, Jesus, it says, is, is heading off into the wilderness at the leading of the Spirit. Uh, it's immediately following his baptism. And so what we have in the, in the whole flow of the story is that Jesus is, if you will, sort of at a mountaintop moment in his ministry. He's being publicly uh, heralded as the Messiah by John the Baptist. He is being affirmed by the Father in heaven, and it's sort of one of those, uh, those anticipatory moments in life where Jesus is now ready to launch out into the very purpose for which he had come, that he would begin to proclaim the kingdom and, more, and work ultimately to the cross. And then we find immediately upon that that he finds himself now led out into the wilderness. And it says that he fasted for 40 days, and I always, I don't know if you're supposed to chuckle at certain parts of the scripture, but it says in the text, he fasted for 40 days, and then he was hungry. And I'm always thinking, I'd have been hungry a whole lot sooner than 40 days. But Jesus is hungry. And then the point of that, I think, is it's, it's laying for us a context. As you look at the other gospel accounts, it says that he was out with the wild beast. And what you have here is a situation that we can relate to. We might not have ever been led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted directly by Satan himself, but I think we can relate to the situation where we find ourselves where we are at a low spot, where we are physically exhausted, we are mentally exhausted, we are spiritually exhausted, and it seems in those moments that's when the enemy loves to work the most. I don't know about you, but for me on this topic of temptation, when I am at my most vulnerable is when I am at my most worn thin. When, when we're, we're constantly going and doing and accomplishing and whatever it is, the task is in front of us, and, and we're not doing the things that we know we ought to do, and we find ourselves sort of at the end of that rope, at the end of that line, and then the enemy shows up. And so that's where Jesus is at. He's in a spot that's very, very much like a spot that you and I may have found ourselves. And so in that moment, then, the enemy comes and he brings temptation. And so Jesus responds to that temptation. And we're going to look a little bit this morning at how that might help us experience breakthroughs in those moments in our own life. We're going to look at two things primarily this morning. We're going to look, first of all, at the source of temptation. And then we're going to look at our resources in temptation. But before we do that, I think we have to understand a little something of temptation. Uh, the first time I can recall us having a dog when I was a kid was when I was in kindergarten and we had this uh, setter mix mutt named Brownie. And Brownie was uh, a thorn in our side, even as kids. This dog was, was incorrigible. She was uncontrollable. But I've had dogs ever since then, all the way through my life, we've had pet dogs. And I, I've shared before how much I love my dogs. And, and I want to use dogs as an illustration, if I can, of temptation. I have known three types of dogs in my life. I have known the dog that will take the sandwich out of your hand while you're standing there. I have known the dog that will wait until you put it down and turn your back to take it. And I've known the dog that won't take anything unless you tell them they can have it. And as I consider dogs and, and how they respond to that, and, and I imagine their thinking goes something like this. A dog sees a sandwich. A dog wants the sandwich. A dog has a decision to make. Is it going to take the sandwich or not, and, I, and I'm not an animal expert, but I, but I can imagine that the moment of decision for a dog is, is a combination of natural instinct and training. In that moment, as much as a dog might be able to reason, they're thinking to themselves, I really want the sandwich, what's the cost? What, what's, my, what's my background, what's my training tell me? If I take the sandwich, what's the, what's the cost of that? If I don't, what's the reward? And so I think at least at some base level, dogs sort of do the math and they decide what direction they're going to take. And so for a dog, perhaps overcoming temptation is really just a matter of their training. Train a dog enough and they won't. But, but what about you and I? 
Is it just a matter of doing the math? All around us in the world, people are doing this equation every day. And to sort of give it a little bit of, of brevity for us this morning, let's put our kids into that scenario for a moment. Let's take our kids. We have our, our graduates who are up here today, and, and many of us have kids, grandkids, uh, young people that we care about. Uh, let, let's see what happens. Now, we have our kids, and, and we, we, we train them, right? The scriptures say to train up a child in the way they should go, and then when they're old, they will not depart from it. And our kids, for a time, may respond to temptation in life with that equation working in their mind. If I do this, what will my parents' response be? What will the, the authority figures over me be? They, they weigh the risk and the reward. But what happens when that's no longer applicable? For our young people that are up here today, my Becca included, uh, she's already 18. She's reminded me of that a couple times. She'll be 19 in June. I've reminded her that that doesn't matter. <laughs> she's an adult, right? In the eyes of society, in the eyes of our culture, and in, in, in a sh very short couple of weeks, the last big kind of milestone that keeps you tethered to the home front is going to pass with graduation. Then what? What is the impetus? What is, what is the resource that, that we can draw on when we no longer have some other person responsible to steer that? And, and for you and I as an adults, that's where we find ourselves. And so we end up in this battle with temptation. We end up with this, in this universal point of, of, of breakthrough that we need. And, and we oftentimes approach it in all the wrong ways. We oftentimes approach it sort of doing that calculation that the dog looking at the sandwich on the plate does and says, you know what, this time I think it's worth it. This time I want it bad enough. This time I'm hungry enough for whatever that is. This time the desire to be fulfilled is strong enough. I'm going to take my chances. And it's why I think for, the, for even believers, we sort of have this, this almost seemingly endless cycle of victory and defeat, victory and defeat, victory and defeat. But I don't believe that's what the Lord's called us to. I don't believe that, that has to be the inevitable outcome. I do believe that you and I can, day by day, by the power of the Holy Spirit, face temptation and sin better than we did the day before. Now, I'm not telling you that you can master this. I'm not telling you that you and I can just sort of arrive at that point where you know, it's, hey, I crossed the threshold. I don't ever have to worry about this in this life again. That, that, that's not a reality apart from the return of Christ. But when we enter into glory, he says at that moment, we will then be made like him. And so we have this, this sort of tension that exists in the church, in the Christian life, between those that, that, that think, well, I've got to just strive and, 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 and hope to do better, or I'm just going to not even worry about it because I don't have any chance anyway. And we live in these two extremes. But there's so much that's tied to victory in the life of the believer. There's so much reality that comes to bear as we approach this issue of temptation and sin that can bring honor and glory to the Lord, that can strengthen and, and proclaim the testimony of the gospel, and can put us, quite frankly, in just a better place today. And so I think there's a very practical reason for the church, for you and I, to consider how it is that we approach this universal sticking point. How it is we approach this universal wall that we need to break through on how do we step into more victory than defeat when it comes to this issue of temptation. So this morning we want to consider that angle on this familiar narrative. We're going to start with the source of temptation. If you're following along in your study notes, it's page 8. Otherwise, the back of your bulletin is available to you. Let's look at a couple of sources of temptation as revealed in our text and in the Scripture. The first is, the devil is a tempter. Verse 1, then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. The Spirit is not the one tempting, but it is the devil who is going to tempt. We see this to be the case. Uh, and, and, and temptation, I think, in its most basic form can be defined as a call to distrust God. Uh, a call, and I don't know if that's the technical definition. You can find it in the back of your Bible and give me a better one later. But as I wrestled with this message uh, some time ago in preparing it, uh, that's, that's sort of the definition that just kept coming to my mind. Lord, what is it about temptation that is so sinister? What about it is so appealing? And it really is, I think, a call to distrust God. We see this in Genesis chapter 3. Eve is, is tempted, it says, by the devil and he starts talking to her about how appealing the alternative to what God is. And did God really say that to you? Did, did, do you think that God is giving you all that, he, that you want or deserve? And so there's this call in the work of the enemy to distrust what God has said. 
And we find that in the text with Jesus. The devil tempts him in three different areas. He, he tests him in the lust of the flesh, the pride of life, and the lust of the eyes. And he takes him and he shows him what could be his. He says, hey, don't you exercise a certain authority? Why don't you demonstrate your power? Why don't you show everybody who you are? If you are the son of God, do this. Feed yourself. Command these stones to be bread. And so he's, he's tempting Jesus to not trust the Father. Remember in verse 1 it says that he was led into the wilderness by the Spirit. In other words, Jesus, and this might be a side lesson for some that you need to hear. Jesus was perfectly in the will of the Father and he was in the wilderness in the hard place. You see, the, the Spirit didn't tempt him, or, or the Spirit didn't lead him to the still waters and the lush green grass that we read about in Psalm 23. The Spirit led him to the wilderness, led him to the wild beast, led him to the place of hunger and want, and he was still perfectly in the will of God. Sometimes I think in life we start to wonder if maybe, you know, life's a little too hard because we're not doing something we ought to be doing. And, and, and maybe the Lord's getting your attention some things. I'm not saying that never happens. But I want us to notice here that the devil tempted Jesus and Jesus was in the will of the Father. He was where he was supposed to be for God's purpose. And so the enemy of our soul, the devil, is the tempter. And I want us to notice that his temptation is comprehensive. Go to, go to Hebrews chapter 4. We're going to look at this a couple of times this morning, but I'll read just verse 15 to get us started. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15. For we do not have a high priest, speaking of Jesus, who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. Sometimes I think we read the account in Matthew... And we think to ourselves, well, Jesus had to face three temptations. Not a big deal, right? How hard can that be? I faced three temptations before I got out of bed in the morning. Boy, it'd sure be nice if they had a story about Jesus. No, Jesus was comprehensively tempted. He was tempted in everything as we are, yet without sin. And so when we consider the idea that the devil is the tempter, we need to recognize he is still a comprehensive tempter. He is still one who operates in this same way. He loves to turn our attention to counterfeit blessings. And I want us to couch sort of his temptations in that way a little bit this morning. Because it's very rare that the enemy comes to us and offers us something we don't already want. Or that our situation wouldn't sort of dictate we might need. He comes and he offers a counterfeit blessing. The devil always trades in immediate rather than long term. He likes to hide the cost and offer something that shines in the moment. He understands our weaknesses to that degree, I believe. And so he says, listen, you don't want to trust God's future promise. You want to, you want to trust my immediate offer. You want to take what's right in front of you. And he is an active temper. That's, that's why in 1 Peter 5, 8, we're reminded to be vigilant, to be sober-minded, because our adversary, the devil, is like a roaring lion, walking around, roaming around, seeking whom he may devour. And so we have temptation. One of the sources of temptation is our enemy, the devil. Now, I stress that to you to say this. Not because, and we're going to see in a moment, we can't just live our life saying, well, you know what? The devil made me do it. I got up this morning with every intention of being a good person. I got up this morning with every intention of obeying God and, and doing what was right. And I went out my front door and what you know what? That bum was waiting for me when I walked out the door and he made me, he tripped me up. That's not the answer we can give. But I, I stress to you to recognize that temptation is not simply or merely a battle of personal will. It is a spiritual battle. And if we don't recognize as the church that we are engaged in a spiritual battle with a spiritual enemy who is powerful and hates us. And one whom we've sung this morning has been overcome by our Savior. If we don't do that, we're, what we're going to do is we're just sort of going to, we're going to take this message, we're going to take this idea of breakthroughs and temptation, and we're just going to make it a that's double our efforts kind of conversation. Well, I'm just going to work harder. I'm just, I'm just going to work harder at being better. And, and what happens with that is we just add fuel to that cycle we talked about at the beginning where we just sort of roll along. Yep, today was a good day. Oh, tomorrow was a bad day. Oh, today, uh, and we just ride that Ferris wheel nonstop. So we have to recognize this is a spiritual battle, a spiritual reality. Ephesians chapter 6, go down there and read about the spiritual armor that you should put on. Recognize that there is someone a, a, that is working against your success 
in this issue of, sin, of temptation and sin. But we want to move beyond that because it's not just the devil that made me do it. We also recognize that temptation is born of our own desires. Go with me to the book of James for a moment. Again, another passage that might be familiar to some of you. James chapter 1, 13 to 15. James chapter 1, beginning in verse 13, reading through verse 15. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself does not tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is carried away and enticed by his own lust. The plain truth of that short section is God is not the source of temptation, and our lust draws us into sin. And so the source of temptation in view here is our own desires. Put simply, we see the sandwich, we want the sandwich, we have a decision to make. That, that, that's the moment we find ourselves in, our own lust and our own desires. And so the question for us becomes, will we trust God or will we trust a lie? Will we choose to follow our own desires and, and then allow temptation to become sin and sin to bring death? Or will we not? Will we check our desires against the truth of God's word? Will we check our desires against the character of the God we serve? This issue of our own desires uh, is, is perhaps the more tricky one for us, particularly for believers who are at least, uh, you know, tangentially aware that there's a Satan, there's a devil that's working against us. Uh, most, most Christians, most believers that read their Bible don't deny the existence of an enemy, don't deny the existence. They might minimize, they might overlook or forget, but, but generally we have a, a foggy idea in our mind that, okay, the enemy's trying to trip me up, I want to be careful with that. But when it comes to our own desires, it becomes more challenging for us. Because one of the things that we, our fallen nature is so very good at doing is rationalizing our decisions and behaviors. There, I, I've met very few people who are actively in the moment of sin, who couldn't in that moment at least make it sound like they made the right decision. Like, like, they're, like they're pretty sure they were doing what they were supposed to be doing. We, we've gotten very good at, 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 at uh, you go, go through the Old Testament narratives, if you're looking for examples of this, you could follow the life of, of Abraham or David. Uh, I mean, look at some of the stuff that Abraham did. And he, he, he believed God and it was counted for him for righteousness. He talked with God. He walked with the Lord. And, and, and he, couldn't, I mean, he couldn't figure out who his wife was and who she wasn't, depending on who was in the room. He wanted to fulfill the promise on his own. And there was all kinds of stuff going on for him. And I'm sure in the moment, if you were sitting there talking to him, you'd be like, yeah, this is, this is a good plan. I think this is a good idea. And we're, we're, we do the same thing. And so this, this idea that, that temptations, one of the sources of temptation is actually within, needs to call us to that vigilance again. We need to understand that, listen, what does Jeremiah say? Don't trust your own heart because it's desperately wicked. We've got to be careful with our perspective on things. We've got to be careful, as the Proverbs say, that we don't lean on our own understandings, but in all our ways acknowledge Him, that He might direct our paths. Those aren't just passages that talk about whether I make, you know, do I make good decision A or good decision B. Those passages remind us that we are not in a good position to make the choice between good and bad. All by ourselves, because we're, we're sometimes our own worst enemy, our own desires, our own lusts, our own thoughts. And a side note on that, I'll just say this, and then we'll, we'll, we'll move into to, to how we can resource some of the things the Lord has for us. But we want to be careful uh, what, what desires we feed. We want to be careful what, what tendencies we feed in our life. There's a reason the scriptures put so much emphasis on getting our mind right. The things we dwell on. Don't dwell on this stuff Dwell on this stuff. Don't think about these. Don't pursue this. Rather, pursue Christ. I think sometimes we talk ourselves into sin. I think sometimes we talk ourselves into a behavior. So like if you wake up, let's just put it in a chronological timeline for you. If you wake up Monday morning aware that the enemy likes to attack you in a particular area of your life, so you're on your guard and you're ready for it, and you kind of work through Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and, and, and you sort of, sort of just sort of, you know, dance next to it for a while. Whatever it is that you're feeding in your life. And then soon enough, you get to Friday, and what, what happens? You wake up Saturday morning and realize, oh no, Friday night was a bad night, right? 
I fell into whatever that situation, whatever that sin was, and, and we think, how did, that, how did that happen? It happens because we sort of just keep it alive. We keep, it, we keep our, our desires on life support sometimes. And here again, the Old Testament narratives are very helpful to us. Because the command of God oftentimes for his people when they were entering into a place that was going to be filled with landmines, filled with these, these opportunities to feed desire, and he says eradicate it. Root and stem, pull it out of the ground. Don't give it room to grow. Don't give it seed to germinate. Don't give it oxygen to breathe. You have to kill it. And that's where we trip up so often, isn't it? We know we, have, we know we have tendencies. We know that we have certain areas, and it might start with the enemy. The enemy might whisper in our ear, hey, remember how much fun that was? Remember how much you enjoyed this or how much you want that? And then we sort of, instead of shutting him down, we said, yeah, I remember, but I'm not doing that today. And we just sort of let it sit there on the table. And so we want to be careful with what desires we feed. And we want to remember that sometimes good things can become bad things. Sometimes we can pursue something that on the front end, in a certain context, is fine, but then we pursue it outside of that context, it becomes a problem. And so there's a lot of nuance to this. We won't cover all of it today, but I want us to recognize those two primary sources, two general sources, if you will, of, of, of temptation in our life. We have an enemy working against us, and we have our own desires working against us, so the question becomes, what hope do we have? What hope do we have to break through temptation and, and, and arrive at a place of victory on the other side of it rather than a place of sin and defeat. If we have a spiritual being power more powerful than us against us and we have our own desires and fallen nature working against us, what do we do with that? And Jesus gives us a little bit of a insight in how he responded to his temptation. I want to say on the front end of this next part of the sermon this. This is not a step-by-step -step checklist. This is, this is not, and we, we, have to, we have to understand that what we are looking at is we are looking at Jesus. This is the power of God in us. And two passages of Scripture come to mind. In John 15, 5, Jesus says, without me, you can do nothing. That's one side of this equation. Without him, none of this matters. And then you have what Paul says in Philippians 4, that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So the two sides of that coin, I can't do anything without him. I can do everything through him and his power in me. And that's really the key for us to understand how do we deal with temptation. You cannot, you and I cannot, by sheer will and logic, overcome the areas of our most vulnerability. Can't do it. You might succeed for a day, a week, a month, but you can't get there absent him. But with him, we are not resigned to constant defeat. Because we can do all things through Christ. And so this isn't a checklist. This is a call to look to the Lord. And he gives us a couple of resources to help us in this understanding. First of all, we need to know God's promises. We need to know his promises. If temptation, our working definition, is a call to distrust God, then the only way to build trust is to know what he has promised for us. We need to know what the word of God says as it relates to this issue of temptation and beyond. Let's look at a couple of passages uh, that we can sort of just frame this around this morning. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. We'll start in verse 12 because it sort of sets the, uh, the context for us a little bit. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 12 and 13. It says, Therefore... Let him who thinks he stands take heed that he does not fall. So in other words, don't get too far ahead of yourself. Don't think yourself above this. This is something that impacts all of us. Verse 13, no temptation has overtaken you, but such as is common to man. And God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will provide the way of escape also so that you will be able to endure it. Verse 14, therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. So we have the promise, first of all, that we are not alone in temptation. One of the tactics the enemy loves to use is uh, on the front end of temptation, say, hey man, everybody's doing this. You think you outgrow that when you get out of middle school, you don't, right? Hey, everybody's into this, man, it's okay. He might even name for you some folks from church that are involved. Like, hey, I think the pastor's even into this stuff. It's cool, it's no problem, right? That's just... And then, so it's everybody's doing it on the front end. You buy the lie, you walk through temptation into sin, and he says, hey, wow, shoo, you're the only one that did that. He likes to isolate. 
He likes to tell you, oh, now you're in, a, you're in a totally, why does he do that? We sang this morning about the grace of God being greater than our past and our sin. The enemy loves to isolate us on the backside of succumbing to temptation. When we find ourselves in sin and come to our senses and realize this was not where I'm supposed to be, he loves to isolate us because he wants us to believe that we are the one person that is outside of the reach of God's grace. He wants to convince you, man, you know, maybe the first time, the second time, the hundredth time that you fell into this pet, this trap, maybe there the Lord will meet you, but you've worn him out. You have just exhausted his grace for you in this situation because you were the only person I know that would do this this many times or that would do this in the way you've done it. He loves to isolate us, but the scriptures tell us, no, look, you know what? There's no temptation to you that isn't common to men. The battle you face it might be a battle that's faced only in your own mind or your own heart, your own thoughts. Maybe nobody in your life knows there's a battle going on. Maybe your wife, your kids, your coworkers, your friends, your husbands. Your, your, nobody knows that you are every morning waking up and fighting for your spiritual life in some area and you don't know how to break through because the, the, the heat is always on high and your desires are working against you and the enemy's working against you and you don't know what to do. I want you to know, he says, you are not alone in that fight. It's common. You're not alone in the battle. Others in the body are going through the same thing. Why does that matter to us? How does that help us break through temptation? Two things, uh, well, two things that we don't really like very much. Transparency and accountability. What happens when you know you're not alone is you start looking for other people. <laughs> it's like, oh, good, you're here. What do we do next? How do we encourage one another? How do we hold one another to a standard higher than ourselves? How do we bring to bear the hard truths of God's word if we live in isolation? If we act as though we are the only one that the enemy has come to with that offer, or the only one that's, that's said yes to something we should have said no to. And so there's a call here for accountability, for, for, for honesty, and then encouragement that comes out of that. And notice when he says, God is faithful. He says, he will make a way of escape. In my own notes on this, in my, my journal, I, whenever I come to this passage, I always, I always refer to those as exit ramps. It's probably my linear mindset that, that allows me to see that, that, that I, I warmed to that picture. But, but if you're just cruising down the road of life, right? And, and there's, if you've ever driven a uh, road tour, road trip family, we drive everywhere we don't have to swim to. <laughs> we love to just be in the car instead. But I'll tell you, your car takes a beating when you're on a road trip. Stuff's tinging off the windshield and off the paint. And it just, people park too close and pass too fast and all that stuff. But you just kind of deal with it. But, but, but you're just cruising down and, and, and temptation comes at you like stone chips and, and debris on the road. And there's a, oh, there's a pothole. I got to miss that. And you're trying to do your best, but some stuff gets through, right? And as you're going along, the Lord says, you know what? This road's getting a little too hot. This road's getting a little too rough. I want you to get off at the next exit. And that exit might be a scripture comes to your mind, a promise of the Lord or a command of the Lord that you hadn't thought about in a while that applies directly to your situation. This morning, I, uh, it's been a while since it's been happening to me, but this morning, uh, the last few mornings, in fact, uh, it, my two o'clock wake up is back. And man, I tell you, I hate that thing. Two o'clock there, I'm awake. Can't sleep. No, and I'm not, not rested, but I can't fall asleep. And I'll lay there. And so the last couple mornings, uh, I've forgotten some of my previous experience in training. And so I just laid there and grumbled about how I wanted to be asleep. And I was just getting more and more tired. And finally, about 5 o'clock, you doze back off just in time for the alarm to go off at 5.30. And so I'd be honest, I said to Michelle this morning, I was getting ready to leave the house. She was up. I said, this is going to be one of those mornings. And she knew what I meant. Nothing was working. I, I, you try to pick something up, you drop something else, you bump into things. It was just a bad morning. So I get to the, I get to the church here, I turn on the coffee and unlock the doors and I go sit in my, my study and I thought, all right, Lord, I, I, I got to figure something out because this is, it can't be one of those mornings the whole morning. I got things to do. And so I grabbed my Bible and I, I, was, I just I started reading in Psalm 119 and I started highlighting some part. Maybe I'll find it for you quick. The, the children's church folks got used to me being done on time the last couple of weeks. <laughs> I want to keep them guessing. Yeah. Here it is. Psalm 119.62. I read this this morning in my study, and it, it, it ties in here, I promise. At midnight, I shall rise up to give thanks to you because of your righteous ordinance. <laughs> Got the time off by a couple hours, but midnight's good. Sometimes the exit ramp is the word of God, and he just reminds us of something. 
And so I, I prayed over it at my desk, and I promised the Lord and myself that, that if it happens again tonight, that I will just get up and go grab my Bible and thank him, because uh, that's probably a better outcome than grumbling about being awake. But sometimes the exit ramps a, pro, a, a word of scripture that comes to you. The Spirit has promised to teach us the things, to call to mind the things of the Lord. Sometimes it's a phone call from a friend saying, hey, how's that, how's that thing working out? How's that situation you find yourself in? How are you doing today? Sometimes it's, it's the still small voice of the Lord that speaks to us. It's, it, it's, it, the exit ramps come in so many different ways. But what we want to be careful is that we don't blow past them. That we don't say, oh, no, I think I can go a little further. I, I think I got a few more miles in me on this, on this trip before I have to get off and get re recalibrated. So I'm just going to keep rolling. We want to take the ramps that he offers. He promises, he says, listen, I will make a way of escape, but you have to decide to take it. You have to decide to, to move off from that. Hebrews, let's go back to Hebrews 4 quick. Hebrews 4, 15 and 16. We looked at verse 15 already. I want you to see how it continues on. Verse 15 we looked at. Hebrews 4, for we do not have a high priest, that's Jesus, who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are yet without sin. Now notice verse 16, there's an outcome to that. It's not just, hey everybody, look, Jesus is the great example, he made it. Look at what it says in verse 16. Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in our time of need. We need to know God's promises so that we can respond in faith to God's promises, so that we have confidence to stand before the very throne of glory and find help in our time of need. We want to be careful that we don't miss the exit ramps that he gives. And there's a myriad of ways in the scriptures, we won't look at them this morning, where specific concerns, if, if this were a seminar setting and, and we were to take questions now and you were to raise your hand and say, will this, situ will you, will this reality of God's promises meet this specific detailed situation? We could answer those in the affirmative. We could, we could dive into the scriptures together. We could find where it does. But for this morning and for our purposes now, I just want you to understand that God wants to meet us in the moments of those temptations. That he wants to, he wants to clearly and, and brightly illuminate the exit ramps of temptation so that we don't end up at the destination of sin. He wants his promises to be known by his people so that we can stand on them in faith. Secondly then, and corresponding to that, we want to believe God's promises. It's not enough to know something. We need to apply it. We look at Jesus in his temptations in Matthew. He knew promises of the Father. He knew the Word of God, the commands that were there. And there's a resolve in the narrative. If you read, if you read the story and you, and, you, and you sort of put yourself in the real time of it, you see, I think, almost this building cadence in the Lord's responses. And you get to that very end. He says, be gone, Satan. That's enough. I put up with this all. I'm going to put up with it. You've, you've questioned God's Word. You've twisted God's Word. You've misapplied it in this situation, and we're done. And it's that, it's that settled resolve of faith, of belief. This is what is true. If I tell my kids, don't steal, I'll provide for you what you need. And they say, okay, dad, I believe you. I, I, I know that and I thank you, I trust you. And then they go out and they steal anyway. Wouldn't it not be reasonable for me to assume that they don't believe me? If, 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 if I promise something good to my children... And they go out and they, they seek it some other way that is not the promise, that is not for their good, that is not born of my love. Can I not reasonably sit back and say the breakdown in this equation is my kids say with their mouths they trust me, but with their actions they don't. And the scriptures say something about fathers who know how to give good gifts to their children. And it says if you being sinful know how to give good things to your kids, imagine what your heavenly father and so, ladies and gentlemen, you and I sit here, and, and I know that these two uh, answers to the question might leave some of you wishing, man, I wish you'd get a little more detail because I've got this really big problem. I want you to understand that knowing and believing God's word is the critical and necessary overarching foundational answer to the question of temptation. Your specific situation may require a specific passage or a specific insight or conversation, but let me understand, let me tell you something. If you don't know or believe what God said, you don't have an answer. And, and I, at, the, at the risk of being overly simplistic, can I just say this? Sometimes it's just that simple. When we complicate our own lives, 
when, when, we, when, we, when we're looking for some magic answer that's got, you know, uh, you know if, you, if you're one of those people that always has a problem for every solution, you're probably unsatisfied right now. But I've gone through this, and I've wrestled with this, and I've thought about it. I'll be honest, this is the one message of the series. I said, Lord, can't you give me like four or five points on how to overcome temptation? Because, you know, if we have four or five, people can pick which one works best. But the reality is, and I might be simpleton, but the reality is, if you don't know and believe, apply and act on what God has said, I don't know what else to say. That's what Jesus did. Jesus just said, hey, this is what the Bible says. And no matter how you twist it, devil, no matter how hungry I am and how good that bread would taste, the Bible says this. And so you and I need to be a people that believe God's promises. So for you and I then, temptation and sin are going to be a constant reality on this side of glory. Yet as I've already said, I don't believe we need to live in this constant cycle. I think if we recognize the sources of temptation, it's a spiritual battle with a real enemy, and it's an internal desire that we have to keep in check to the standards and the belief and the truth of God's word. If we'll take his truth, if we'll know his truth, if we'll apply his truth, if we'll live on it as if it were the very air we breathe, I believe that he wants to bring victory and breakthrough in areas of temptation. That we can break through that cycle of constantly falling and coming up short. It isn't easy. It's, it's, not, it's not snap your fingers. There's a reason it's a battle, folks. There's a reason it's, it, it, it requires us to bring all of our energy and all of our vigilance and rely on all of the Lord's resources. But I think it's worth it. And the encouragement I have for us is this. Uh, you all know my favorite verse, 1 John 1, 9. Uh, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us. But I want to close with just... Uh, the last part of the letter of Jude. This is a, a common uh, benediction at church, but I want us to hear what he says. Verse 24 of Jude. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to make you stand in the presence of his glory, blameless, blameless with great joy. Uh, did you hear that? To him, to Jesus, who is able to keep you from stumbling. How are you dealing with the temptation in your life? How are you dealing with the, the hard spot that always catches you? My guess is, if it's a, if it's a constant cycle of defeat, my guess is you're, you're, you're relying on yourself. You're relying on moralism or shame or guilt. You're relying on yourself. And he says here, to him who is able to keep you from stumbling. Ladies and gentlemen, as we said in the earlier sermons and we're going to say through this series, the answer to the question is Jesus. That's the answer to the question. He is able to keep you from stumbling. And then notice, and to make you stand in the presence of his glory, blameless with great joy. There is coming a day, folks, where our battle with sin and temptation will be brought to an abrupt and total end. And we will stand in his presence and glory and we won't be marred and we won't be scarred and we won't be bruised by the sin and temptation that so easily besets us. We will be made as he is. We will stand before him blameless in his presence to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, authority before all time and now and forever. Amen, Jude says. You see, for the Lord, your completion, your ultimate victory over sin is, is for nothing less than His eternal glory. And we should be encouraged by that, that we don't fight this battle alone. And we shouldn't be given over to the thought that, well, if I can't have total victory now, I might as well just live in total defeat. Don't do that to yourself. There's blessings, manifold blessings to obedience, to winning this battle of temptation. So I encourage you, if you want to see God break through in that area in your life where the enemy and your own desires always seem to pound you, always seem to trip you up, can you, can you, can you follow the example of Christ? If you're not in the habit of being in his word, ladies and gentlemen, you're fighting this battle with both hands tied behind your back. And, and you can come to church every time the doors are open. 
and it won't make this di the difference that sitting down in the quietness of your own space and going to his word will make. So I encourage you, know his word, know his promises, believe them, apply them, rest in them, trust him to be the one who can break through that spot. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your word this morning. Lord, so much more could be said and likely needs to be said, but we don't have the time and I don't have the capacity to say it. And so, Lord, we're going to trust that what has been said and what your word has revealed to us will be applied in our situation. Lord, we're about to come to your table. We're about to be reminded, we're about to celebrate the price paid for victory. Lord, you won the victory over sin and death. And Lord, you can bring victory in specific places in our life where the enemy gets us defeated. And so, Lord, I pray that as we come to your table, as we consider your word, as we, as we just sort of think on these things throughout the next hours or days, Lord, that, that you would give us victory, that you would, would bring us to a place where we avail ourselves to the resources we have in Christ. And we would see, we would see the other side of temptation, not as a destination of inevitable defeat, but as a destination, Lord, where we stand in your, in your glory. Lord, we stand in victory. Help us to trust you in the promises you have given. And we ask this in Jesus' blessed name. Amen. If I could have the elders who are coming to serve come. If you are at home this morning, we encourage you to grab some elements. Uh, again, the magic is not in the elements. The power is not in the kind of uh, cracker or juice you have available to you. It is in the posture of our heart. Uh, as we come to the Lord's table. So those at home, please join us if you are able. Uh, those who are here and visiting, I invite you. Uh, this is the Lord's table. It is not uh, my table or the elder's table or the church's table. So if you're here today or watching at home today and you know the Lord is your Savior, you have brought your sin and brokenness in faith and laid it at His feet and received from Him grace and forgiveness and mercy. If you, if you know the Lord this morning, please join us as the elements are passed. Celebrate in solemn remembrance with us as we consider the broken body and shed blood of Jesus. If you're here this morning or at home watching and you don't know the Lord is your Savior, some other motivation has brought you to this place this morning, and I'm grateful that you are here or that you are watching. I'm glad that, that even in these days in your life of just investigation and questioning that you have come uh, at least this far, and I encourage you, consider what the Lord has for you. Consider the reality of your sin. Consider the reality of His grace, purchased full and free at the cross of Calvary. And, and, and He tells us in His Word that if we believe and confess... We'll be saved. If we repent from our sin and put our trust in Him, He's waiting to make us new. And He offers that this morning, even now as you sit here or sit at home. So I'd encourage, if you don't know the Lord, today can be the day. In fact, you can, you can take care of that need as the elements are coming your way, and you can celebrate and rejoice as they get to your row because it doesn't take uh, weeks and weeks and weeks. You don't have to. It, it's, it's just Jesus is waiting. If you have questions, I'd encourage you. Let the elements pass. And then see me after the service. Grab me after church. Grab one of the elders. Grab someone that brought you here this morning. Reach out to a Christian friend or relative and say, hey, talk to me more about this. I don't, I don't think I'm there yet. I'm not ready. I don't know what that's all going to require of me. And that's okay. But ask the questions. Get the answers. And see if the Lord isn't, isn't wonderful. So I encourage you in those things this morning uh, as we partake. Gentlemen, if you'd come, please. As the elements are passed, I remind you to take both cups that are in the tray. There's a top cup of juice, a bottom cup that contains the cracker. Uh, so take both of those if you would. Hold those elements until all have been served, and then we'll partake together.
Would you pray with me? Father, I thank you for what this represents. Lord, I was reminded even yesterday, Lord, as you were in the garden praying that this cup would be removed from you, and yet it wasn't. Lord, it was because of your love for us that you told your son he had to bear the cross for us. And Lord, we are so grateful for that. Lord, your body broken, your blood shed on our behalf, that we would be made new, Lord, that we would be welcomed at this table, Lord. We are so thankful for your love, for your mercy, for your grace, for what this represents. And Lord, we look forward to the day uh, in heaven when we get to dwell with you and and be at your table, Lord. Uh, Lord, help us right here, right now, though, Lord, to uh, be grateful and thankful uh, for what this table represents, what it means, and the cost uh, that was paid for us, for our salvation, Lord. We just thank you, and we love you, and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. For I have received from the Lord that which also I delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, in the night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. As the musicians come to the stage again and we close our service, I encourage you. We do have two additional opportunities for ministry. One is to come forward for prayer if you'd like the elders to anoint you for anything. Or if you'd like to pray for or on behalf of another, we encourage you to come forward and do that. The other is as you leave this morning, there will be an usher at the back door to receive the benevolent offering. If you have a financial need that we can come alongside and assist you, would you please just reach out to the office or one of the elders that we might be able to come alongside you and bless you as the Lord has blessed us as well. With that, if you're able, please to stand as we close our service this morning. Standing on the promises of Christ my King, through eternal ages let his praises ring. Glory in the highest I will shout and sing. Standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing. Standing on the promises of God my Savior. Standing, standing. I'm standing on the promises of God. Promises of Christ the Lord, bound to Him eternally by love's strong cord, overcoming daily with the Spirit's sword, standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing, standing on the promises of God, my Savior, standing, standing. Standing on the promises of God. You are dismissed, thank you.